We never really think of Namibia as one of Africa's sporting powerhouses compared to the illustrious record of Kenyans, South Africans and Ethiopians who typically win the most of any African country. Namibia first participated at the Olympic Games in 1992 and has since then racked a grand total of only five silver medals. So when two promising Namibian teenage sprinters, Christian Mboma and Beatrice Masilingi, who happened to have four of the top five 400 meter times in the world this year, qualified for the ultimate sports tournament in the world, it was a monumental moment for Namibian sports. However, just before the tournament, the two ladies received a bone-chilling report from World Athletics, formerly the International Association of Athletics Federations, that ruled them ineligible to compete at the Tokyo Olympics. The decision could easily have been passed for a doping problem, but it was anything but. They weren't banned because they cheated, but because sports officials had decided that they no longer qualified as female athletes. Even though they are national heroes back home, their promising careers have, like many others before them, boiled down to defending their identities as female athletes. Narrow hips, wide shoulders, pronounced jawline, they must be men. Welcome to Reason Africa. For decades, sports governing bodies have regulated women's participation in sport through sex testing. Sex verification practices started in the 1940s out of suspicion sparked by rumors that some countries were allowing men to compete disguised as women. By the 1960s, sports governing bodies such as the IAAF and the IOC began systematic mandatory testing of suspected women athletes based on these rumors that some women were more male than female, resulting in unfair competition for real women. Anyway, in an effort to thwart the rumor, the IOC and other sports federations introduced procedures to sex test women athletes. The earliest tests included compulsory genital or gynecological exams or so-called nude parades, where female athletes were forced to parade in the nude in front of a panel of doctors who would later decide whether the case was a woman or a man. In the years to follow, sports governing body officials later described the genital inspections as invasive in nature, and policymakers decided to abandon them, ushering in a shift to less abusive exams. Most recently, their criteria for female competitors has been testosterone, a hormone produced by both men and women. Mboma and Masilingi became the latest women athletes ruled ineligible to compete due to naturally high levels of testosterone, and the IAAF claims that there is a significant connection between high testosterone and athletic performance. The sprinters were tested during a medical assessment and their levels exceeded the limit by a world athletics policy on athletes with differences of sex development or DSD. The global governing body requires that female athletes' blood testosterone levels be under 5 nanomoles per liter, which is double the normal female range of below 2 nanomoles per liter to compete in select women's events, specifically from 400 meters to 1500 meters or the mile when it introduced the new DSD regulations. Any woman with naturally occurring testosterone in the normal male range would be ineligible to compete unless she lowered her levels, meaning that women with high natural testosterone levels must take medication to reduce them to be allowed to compete in middle distance races. Their interpretation is that testosterone increases muscle mass, strength and hemoglobin, which affects endurance. Athletes, scientists, and biochemists were drawn into the debate. In 2019, world and Olympic champion South African middle distance runner Casta Semenya challenged the DSD regulations in the court of arbitration of sport 
but lost. She has been the most outspoken critic of the Federation rules. In the ruling, the judges argued that the DSD regulations will remain in place because of the dilemma of rights, that is, the right of Semenya to compete in sport according to her legal sex and gender identity, and on the other side, the right of other athletes below the defined testosterone threshold to compete under fair conditions. The double Olympic 800-meter champion, however, refused to take any drugs to alter her testosterone levels. Her lawyers argued that this should be regarded as negative doping, so to speak, as it implies drug use to reduce and not to enhance performance. They said that medication of perfectly healthy individuals against their will is considered cruel and unusual punishment. The scientific community is split on this, with some saying that testosterone is not the only factor that is important for an individual's athletic performance. There are not only other physiological factors like VO2 max, heart size, athletic aptitude, and the list goes on, but there are also factors that don't have to do with someone's physiology. Factors like nutrition, coaching and equipment all play into an athlete's performance, so it's unclear how testosterone can be singled out as the defining factor. One might think that these ladies are the only athletes to ever possess bodies that are so greatly different from everyone else's. It seems the sports world has forgotten the peculiarities of Michael Phelps or even Usain Bolt, who are both with peculiar physicality than most of their competitors. Upon reaching the 200 meters Olympics finals, Namibia's Mboma ran a fascinating race, ultimately placing second and winning silver after Elaine Thompson Hera, but ahead of decorated competitor Shelian Fraser Price, breaking the world junior record in the event and also made her the very first female Olympic medalist in the entire history of Namibia. But, unlike Phelps or any other athlete with anatomical advantages that help them perform better, Mboma is being penalized for a naturally occurring hormone. Various African Athletics Federations have been questioning why two teenagers representing the United States and Great Britain who won gold and silver in the women's 800 meters beating seasoned runners in the process were not subjected to suspicion or demands for testosterone tests raising concerns that the testosterone tests are reserved only for African women, either to keep them out of sport or to slow them down. Amid all the heavy criticism for the DSD rules, with allegations that the science is flawed and potential medical side effects unknown, World Athletics officials described the regulation as discriminatory but necessary. Quote, such discrimination is a necessary, reasonable, and proportionate means of achieving world's athletics objective of preserving the integrity of female athletics. Now this is the part that gets interesting. The sports body has a policy that only athletes identified as suspicious need to be tested, which means deciding who is tested can depend on an athlete's physical appearance, and it might be that non-white athletes from the global south are being selected for testing because they don't fit a stereotype of what a female should look like. The world athletic system is not foolproof. A female athlete could very well fit into their accepted female physical characteristics. Obviously, the naked eye is not a foolproof system. For all we know, hundreds of women would have been burned if the system was indeed fair. Let me take you back to the 16th century where all of this began. When European explorers who made their way to the African continent began remarking on the anatomical features of the populations they encountered, many comparisons made between African and European women not only promoted arbitrary markers of racial difference and inferiority, but also justified the exclusion of African women from the category of woman altogether.
World athletics remains committed to a centuries-old white supremacist notion that defines womanhood in terms of the white female body, rendering everyone else, especially women of African descent, as socially unacceptable abnormalities. Increasingly, what started out as a debate on sexism is turning out to be one on racism. Remember Sarah Batman? Two centuries ago, Sarah Batman died after years spent in European freak shows, more commonly known by her derogatory nickname, the Hottentot Venus, encompassed the West's fixation on black women's bodies and their so-called deficiencies that made them less womanly than their white counterparts. Captured and enslaved in what is now South Africa, Batman was brought to Europe and paraded in circuses and public squares with crowds invited to look at her large behind. Batman died on 29th December 1815, but her exhibition continued. Her brain, skeleton and sexual organs remained on display in a Paris museum until 1974. Her remains were not repatriated and buried until 2002. Today, she is seen by many as the epitome of colonial exploitation and racism, of the ridicule and ostracizing of African women. While some might dismiss the relevance of these concepts today, chalking them up to a long ago historical era of racism, they nonetheless helped the West institutionalize racism in areas like sports. Take sex hormones for example, the idea that there are racial differences in testosterone and estrogen levels, particularly between black and white groups, is widely held, yet still highly debatable. The list of women being targeted has been growing, seemingly mostly from Africa. Burundian runner Francine Yonsaba, one of Semenya's competitors in the 800-meter run, has since revealed that she is one of a growing number of female athletes, mostly from the global south, who has been put directly in the crosshairs of world athletics regulations. Former top junior athlete Annette Negesa from Uganda recently disclosed that she underwent invasive surgery at the behest of world athletics doctors to ensure she could continue competing. Complications from a procedure left her damaged, both mentally and physically. There have never been comparable regulations for men. Otherwise, you can only imagine the Pandora's box if men with low testosterone levels demand to start competing as women. A number of solutions have been proposed to end the acrimony. One option could be to establish an own class for DSD athletes where they could compete against themselves. This, however, has been criticized as implying stigmatization of a vulnerable group and challenged their right to privacy. Back in Namibia, it remains to be seen whether Christine Mboma will be allowed to continue competing in the 400-meter dash. It seems Federation rules on testosterone could shift the way we understand what athletic performance and competitive sports are all about. Our desire to inspire a passion for learning about Africa runs deep. If you'd like to increase your understanding of all matters Africa, start now by subscribing and you'll be on your way. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.